Hello everyone and welcome to my new, sh my new show, Out of Nowhere. Well, my special guest today is Gary King. Gary has been interested in crop circles and has lectured both nationally and internationally and featured in numerous TV productions regarding the phenomena. Can we please welcome the show? Hello there. Hello, Bob. How are you, mate? Are you hearing me? I'm doing great. Thank you very much. Anybody any questions in the chat room? Put them in capitals and then I will um, send them to Gary. How did you get involved with crop surfing? Uh, so <clears throat> it was around 1997. I... Um... I was going through a bit of a life change, you know, my marriage had come to an end and I had a bit of a nervous breakdown really and, and was sort of looking for solutions to calm down, you know, yoga and Tai Chi and meditation, all those kinds of new agey things. Um, and I bumped into a, I, I went to a sweat lodge ceremony. Um, I've been reading up on Native American stuff and I was reading up on all sorts of stuff. And um, there was this sweat lodge, I lived in Cardiff and there was this sweat lodge ceremony on, so I went. And um, a couple of days after, well, the next day, really, I felt very energised. I'd been low and, you know, sort of like no energy and depressed for a number of months. And I felt like, you know, I'd been sort of plugged into the national grid the following day. I was like, wow, this is this is pretty amazing. All, uh, all I did was went for a sort of a sauna, really. It was hot, but it was, you know. Um, and so uh, I'd met some people there who... Um, we talked about some F Gabriel Roth's five rhythms dancing that was taking place in Cardiff on Monday night, which is a kind of shaman dancing. And, and I was kind of into reading up and learning all I could about shamanism. I'd never really heard about mm. them before at that time. Um, so I said, all right, I'll come along. So I went along on the Monday night and, and I have to say, I hadn't danced for years really like that. And, and, and they, you know, they went through this whole process of five rhythms and danced my ass off and, and then the next day felt like I'd been plugged into the national grid even more. And um, oh, where's all this energy coming from? And then the following day, I was over a friend's chatting and <clears throat> telling him about how I felt. And then I was feeling amazingly better, you know, that, than I had been for several months previously. And um, and then that evening sort of had a very profound kind of dreamlike state in consciousness where, um, I don't know, the world, the world just seemed a little surreal in a way. And... Um, and I thought, well, I'll contact this guy who I'd done the sweat lodge with and try and find out if he's got any answers to why why I've just experienced what I've experienced or if he knows anything about it. You know, he seemed pretty smart. Anyway, I tracked him down. He was an American guy that was over doing a tour with one of his students. Who she had, she'd written a book and, on spirituality. That's why the sweat lodge had taken place. And so uh, I know I tracked him down, went over and explained, you know, I had this profound experience and um, it was all very personal and blah, blah, blah. And, and, and he sat and listened to me and he basically gave me a few meditation exercises to do and that was it um and as i was leaving uh, the lady said um you know um will you i i was doing some she said i'm over from america and i need to get a lift to go to go, um, go some book signings would you take me and i said yeah all right because i was so keen to get information and that's when she told me that the uh, you know when I picked her up the next day she said um, oh that I said where's the other guy you know and she said oh he's he's um, he's gone over to the crop circles and I'd heard about them years before you know on the news and stuff but I was you know business world then I wouldn't really take any notice that much <clears throat> yeah um, because I was so sort of keen to get answers to the experience I'd had and how I was feeling in general um, I said I'll oh, tell him I'd be interested to go over there and check them out you know. He said, oh, I'll, I'll tell him. And, and then a couple of weeks, I forgot about it, really. And then a couple of weeks later, this phone call came out of the blue. And he and this guy said, I'm heading over to the crop circles. Do you want to come with me? And and I did. And, and that was it, really. I, walked, I drove over there. That was the, I think that was the 11th of July, to 1997. <clears throat> and um, a newly formed crop circle had appeared the night before. And we, as we drove into Alton Barnes, which is kind of the hub of where the crop circles take place, um there was this crop circle, you know, laid out in the field. And I and I didn't even know. I just said to him, is that a crop circle? And he said, stop the car. You know, and we stopped the car and went inside. And um, and I never really left crop <laughs> circles after that. You know, that was it. I was hooked. What did you, did it, did you feel any being 
in the crop circle. Did I feel any what, sorry? <clears throat> sorry, Bob, you broke up there. What What did you say? Oh, so, um, did you feel any different when you went inside a crop circle? Yeah, I mean, that was the, that was the thing, really. I'd, um, <clears throat> I'd done a lot of martial arts training in my life and... and um, just before I got married, I'd done a load of stuff on chi, you know, chi gung, which in the eighties, the early eighties, sort of nineteen eighty two, in that was was a was a relatively rare concept compared to how it is today. Um, and um, and so I was, you know, I'd explored this whole notion of energy and stuff in my in in, in the, my life before I'd got married. And when I walked into this crop circle, the first thing that I felt was this tingling in my hands, which immediately reminded me of what I used to do years before. And then this this guy that took me over there, this teacher, <clears throat> excuse me, he said mm. um, he asked me if I'd got if I've ever done any qi gong, and and I and I I had you know and I and I'd been reading books on it as well recently, and so I said yeah I've done I have done some, and so he gave me a qi gong exercise to do, and after he did that he laid me down, he took me over to where there was like a junction of the of the crop going in different directions, and he laid laid me down, said lay there where you're back you know you your belly on the floor there um which i did and and i immediately went into this kind of like weird dreaming state where it's like i had a dream of all the crop laying down it was only for a few seconds but it was really clear oh. in my mind's eye um and it sort of shocked me really because it was almost like i just closed my eyes and there i was and and, and, I, and it was almost like i was at wheat level you know and i saw the wheat just as if it went down then folded over itself as it all went down like in an order and I opened my eyes and said to this guy, you know, it goes down, re it's, it goes down really fast. And, and, and he just looked at me and grinned like he knew something I didn't. And I think that was probably why I, you know. Also, there was all these, there was a school teacher that had taken a load of her <laughs> students um, into the crop circle to do painting. And there was all, there was this atmosphere in the center of it with all these people that were doing watercolor paintings inside that was really peaceful. You know, there was this. There was this whole, and I'd never really, you know, it was the first time in my life I'd ever walked into a field yeah. of crops. I was, I was, I'd, I'd, I'd been born in a city. I'd, I grew up in a city. I lived in a city. You know, I'd never really been to farmland before, especially not walked out into the middle of a farm and looked around at the landscape, sitting inside some geometric shape. You know, it's, it was a, the whole experience was surreal in itself, really. Oh God, I bet it was because. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, I was brought up in a city as well, so I've never seen a, a crop circle after all these years. Really? And never been to one. Well, you should try, Bob. It's a, it's a good experience, I have to say. You know, you can they try don't, and get to... but I'm, yeah. I shall do. I shall do. You know. Um, can you tell the difference between a, a fake crop and one of these other crop circles what, what appear overnight? Well, I'd say I say yes, but um, you know you can be fooled because there you know people can do things which which are shocking, you know, um, surprising. But <clears throat> the normal thing to look for really. Um, I, I my my sort of litmus test that I've developed over the over the years, and I and I have to say before I say this that that's that's not really my focus of of the crop circles anymore. You know, it, it was in the early days, but and it is for a lot of people in the early days. Some move on, some stay there, some leave, but um, it's also a very subjective thing. The test for it, as well as a, as a, as an objective thing. So the objective tests are the size of it, the time frame, and the condition of the laid crop, plus any other kind of extenuating circumstances. So so, <clears throat> so if you get a crop circle that has got 150 individual circles or 200 or 400 individual circles, all of varying size, that's laid out over eight or 900 feet uh, in, a, in a complex mm. pattern, and... Um, and we know that it appeared um, in a time frame of, let's say, five or six hours, which is the darkness, the period of darkness in British summertime. 
um, and, and then you look at the condition of the laid crop inside and you can't find any damage to the crop that's consistent with boards that would have stamped it down um, then 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 you you know you've got you've got a problem you've got a mystery on your hand because in all the ones that have been demonstrated to us by human beings they're usually very small sort of 90 feet in diameter rather than five or six hundred feet um they're normally not sorry not normally they're always the crop inside is damaged after they've been in there with their boards and so they've never been able to replicate one that's got no damage to the crop and then they'll normally take quite a long time to do it so for example there was there was a commission a million dollar advertising campaign on behalf of a beer company uh, where they hired 40 engineers and surveyors to make a crop circle in in new zealand i believe they made it or australia some one of those countries down there and and it was it was a, it was basically a replica of the beer label the ashai beer japanese beer company and it, and it, and these guys went out there and they cut oh, the yeah. crop. they they marked it out they had very sophisticated gps technology and they marked it out and put hammered stakes in the ground which are obviously all visible after the event after the event and they didn't lay the crop over they 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 cut it out with with stri you know fly mows kind of weed whackers big industrial ones and tractors with barrel roller cutters on the back they just cut it all out and that took them a week right. working from seven in the morning till seven at night so if we look at just one example of the milk hill crop circle of 2001 where you had a 409 individual circles laid over 800 i think and 80 feet in diameter um all of varying sizes all perfectly laid out and Gosh. not laid on flat ground laid on uneven ground and we know that it poured with rain that night absolutely right. you know can be verified uh, and we know that there was nothing there before sunrise uh, sunset sorry 11 o'clock roughly the sunset's around 10 and it doesn't get darker till about 11 and then the light your first light you start to see things at about you know quarter to four in the morning um and then it starts by four o'clock ten past four you, you know it's light the sun hasn't come up but the way that the, pl the planet's orientated we get more light earlier on before sunrise and there it was um and so you know those those examples are, ex are extreme examples of what what we've seen people can do oh, and then what we've had under mysterious circumstances that that tick the boxes and have no damage crop and they're massive and we know that they've been they've been executed within five or six hours of absolute darkness in the pouring rain that's the problem so that's that's how i normally would say yeah i put my money on that one not being um made by people because of those things there's a question from rebecca when and where it was the last Oh, now she's going to test me. I went with some Canadian filmmakers to one crop circle last year, the last couple of years. So I lived in Mexico for a couple of years. And then when I came back, I took some Italian friends to a few crop circles the year before last. And then mm. last year, the only time I went out was with some Canadian filmmakers. Um, let me see if I can find it for her. Um, bear with me. Uh, and I, it was in Hampshire. Uh, once you've been into so many crop circles, um, you know, I've been, I don't know. I Circle, estimate, I yeah. Est I, imagine. I, I estimate that it's been about a thousand crop circles over 27 years. Um, are you still seeing me all right? Yeah. Oh, my. Okay, hang on. Uh, right. I still see you, okay cool let me just, i'm nearly i'm gonna look at the pictures he sent uh, mm. i can always come back to that one yeah don't know i'm sorry it was in hampshire 
Uh, I'll find a picture and I'll post That's it. That's fine. Chat and, and so um, she can find it. It's all right. We can come back to that. Steph's got a question. What does he the symbols found in crop circles mean? And why are the same symbols found in Samaria and Mayhem calendar? What are these symbols trying to tell us? Thank you. Now, that, that's a question I love. Thank you, Steph. Okay. What they mean is far more interesting than who makes them. It really is, and that's what's kept me occupied. You can only stick around for so long if you keep asking the same question over and over again. You've got to have lots of questions to ask, and this is the, this is the, this is the one that money's on for me. Okay, so um yeah let's let me start with it. it's going to be a fairly long answer because it's not a straightforward question um you know it's not a one one sentence answer unfortunately it's 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 a it's a it's, it's, an, on, it's an ongoing yeah, that's good. it's an ongoing um phenomenon that hasn't ended so if there is a communication yeah. then it, it's not you know the person the the the, the 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 authors of the crop circles haven't finished their sentence yet because it's still it's still happening yeah but what, we, what I've deduced so far and what <laughs> I've taken from other people so far is um, there are about five categories of crop circles. The first one is geometry that everybody realises. Second one is, is philosophical and religious symbols. Things like things from the Mayan calendar or the Wings of Horus, the Jewish uh, menorah, the Kabbalah, Tree of Life from the Kabbalah, the Yin Yang from Chinese philosophy, the Cross of Christ the face of Christ. Um, it seems that we're being reminded about all the things that we've contemplated uh, or we've we've toyed with, symbols that we've come up with and designed when we've been trying to contemplate the divine or the mystery, the metaphysical side, the spiritual side of life. So those symbols are represented. Third, third category is animals, insects and birds and plants, uh, birds. So, so a lot of nature, dragonflies, um, butterflies, spiders, ants, um, birds, hummingbirds, like the hummingbird in the Nazca lines in Peru, that's been represented. Fourth category is astronomical symbols, planets, where the planets are, where we are in relation to some other planets in our solar system and so on. And the fifth category is abstract. An abstract in itself is defined as something that has contact with the other, okay, the metaphysical. So let me just say that geometry is number represented as a, as a shape in space. So a triangle is, is three, the number three, because there's three points, and it defines an area, a space that's in the mm. centre an inside space and an outside space and a square would be four in space and a pentagon would be five in space and so on so um music is number in time okay and the thing about number is that number existed before we did we, we've just described abstract symbols to represent number but what number really is is intangible it's 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 not there you know there's a collection of trees and we've we've gone well we'll call that one two three to mean a quantity but but number like five petals on a flower or when we are born we have five teeth in each quarter of our mouth and they fall out and replaced by eight teeth those numbers are constants the same as musical numbers are constants if you want to tune a guitar if you, if you look at the top string of a guitar it's an e note you don't have to be musically trained. If I pluck the top note of a guitar without putting my finger anywhere on it, mm. you'll, you'll hear an E note. That's one whole string. If I divide that string by, by half, put my finger in the halfway mark and, and press it, so it's a two to one ratio, and pluck it again, you'll hear the E note but an octave higher. So, so what's happening is that number and consciousness, our consciousness, are recognising harmony and it's based on what we call number so let let me try and elucidate a little further and i borrowed this from scott onstock the, the sacred geometer he, he wrote this book sacred geometry he's going to be a guest on my podcast next week and it's like oh, language yeah. it's like language okay he describes and this is a great way of describing it 
language is a map it's not the terrain the terrain is consciousness is mind and so what that means is is that words are just words right that we've come up with to represent things but when you string those words together in a story there's a meaning and the meaning isn't anywhere in those words the meaning exists within us we come to meet those words and give them meaning so so consciousness and words go together and and, and the language the is a map that points to consciousness now number and geometry because mm. it's abstract because it's like meaning meaning doesn't have any substance that, that comes from this metaphysical side what you would call the spiritual side in some traditions and so so when we're talking about the questions of life the big questions of life about what is the meaning of life why are we here and so on the reason that the greeks used geometry as a tool to discover the truth about reality is that it also exists within consciousness because we are able and wired to recognize harmony and disharmony and that can be in the form of music don't have to be musically trained if someone throws a bum note in we know it's a wrong note if somebody like when they built the gothic churches they knew that these musical proportions and ratios could be built into the architecture so that when we look at it it took, speaks to our instincts our intuition and says that feels right and the, and the way it feels right is because it's coming from deep within our consciousness it's what what we would call our spirit spiritual side let's say right so so the reason that these um, symbols represent some of the Sumerian and Mayan calendar symbols is because these traditions also talked about their relationship to the cosmology, how we relate to the whole and how the whole relates to us. What's the meaning of life, in other words? And that's the language of the crop circles. So I hope that answers your question, Steph. Very interesting, very interesting. I'll tell you what I want to, to ask you about. Matthew Williams and this criminal damage affair. Criminal damage? Tell us a little about what went on there. What do you mean, criminal damage? Yeah, um, this Matthew Williams story. Which which story? There's lots of stories involved in Matthew Williams. Be specific. Some oh, God. Oh, God. Did he report him or, or did he um, want to damage us? Sorry, you broke up, mate. What did you say? Oh, uh, yeah, uh, Matthew Williams. Um, well, there's something about they wanted to claim criminal damage or something against me. No, no, against somebody else. I don't know who it was. I don't no, know. it was against you. Um, I, I don't know that story. Um, not that I, I don't know that story. I mean, um, Matthew Williams has been involved in lots and lots of controversy. There's lots of stories about him, but I don't know the one that you're referring to. That's Can't okay. Be. That's all right. Um, yeah, that's okay. Yeah, yeah. I know you've been you've been to a lot of crop circles all over the world. Uh, there's lots of difference people. You know, when you're in the middle of it on in the crop circle, can you hear any sound or any J do, do you feel any you're in the crop circle? Or do you hear um, any sounds? So, so uh, over the years, people have reported, I've heard it once or twice myself, it's like a trilling sound. Um, it's, a, it's difficult to describe, but it's like a trilling sound that you, that you don't really, it's weird because it's quite ear piercing. And yet mm. when you hear it, you don't acknowledge it at first. It's got this other quality to it. Um, um, one of the things about going to the crop circles as well is is that for the first several years for the first 10 years in my case m my teacher the guy who took me to the crop circles was very keen for me to observe how I reacted how I felt and and, and taught me to pay attention to oh, the yeah. before the during and the after he, he would ask me to acknowledge 
take take you know 30 seconds or a minute before I went into a crop circle to acknowledge how I felt acknowledge what had happened in the journey to get there mm. if there'd been any strangeness or anything that had happened that stuck in my mind you know just to acknowledge it and then observe myself as much as possible whilst I was in it and then afterwards for the next evening you know what how did I feel when I came out not just immediately but for the rest of the evening and so that's what I did um, and then after I did that for 10 years I, I, I became a tour guide for lots of people I took lots and lots of people to crop circles over the years and and, and it was all based on people just referring people to me to take them um, and so I used to be able to observe the reactions that they had going into crop circles and right and so, so I've got this kind of sociological kind of study that went on with my own research where I was able to, you know, not only feel what I was feeling subjectively, but, but, but see what other people are having to others. And it's, and it's, and I can say to you that it's ranges from headaches. You go into one crop circle and you might get a headache, right? But the next person, the person next to you, they might get drunk, you know, feel like dizzy or or they might feel nothing at all or or they might feel elated mm. or, so or they might start crying people cry quite a lot when they go in crop circles um the re the reactions do you think it's gary do you think it's a consciousness do i think it's another consciousness did you say do you think it's through consciousness um yeah through what do you mean by through consciousness well people feeling different i what's what's happening to them yeah in the middle yeah. of a crop circle yeah so it's like um how can i describe it it's like um so so a herbalist once said to me that the difference between herbal medicine and pharmaceutical medicine is that the pharmaceutical the active ingredient in the pharmaceutical has been has been isolated so for example aspirin comes from willow bark and it's salicylic acid right they've just extracted the salicylic acid the active component of of right. um, what what it is aspirin from from the willow bark and, and then they give that to you that in some chalk and and then that that has a side effect of giving you stomach problems because it's quite acidic for the stomach right but if you just boil up some willow bark in some yeah. tea, then you don't get stomach problems. And the reason is, is that inside that willow bark are lots and lots of tannins. And there's a symphony of different chemicals and, and compounds which which seem to tailor themselves to each specific individual for what they need. So some will get switched on and some won't get switched on for one person. And then in others, they'll be different. It's almost like like that compound like plant has its own intelligence it doesn't of course but but it adapts itself to the individual yeah. well it's almost like the crop circles do that they, they they give the person individual person what they need and it's probably a bit of a stretch to say they give it to you it's just what what happens to you you just get the reaction that that fits with you do you know what i mean it's like it's like um it's like when people talk to me about crop circles, if someone comes over and says, I think the crop circles are this, this and this, or I think the crop circles are man-made and they're this, this and this, it doesn't tell me anything about crop circles. It usually tells me more about them. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does, yeah. Uh, when we talk about crop circles, have you ever been interviewed by the government about crop circles? No. Never. Because, you know, I, uh, no, just Never. makes you wonder that I suppose when you're doing a tour, you don't stop somebody from the government going with your party. And then uh, and, and when Derek Savory used to go to Rendlesham, he said, I'd done a party with somebody. And when I came back, somebody from the government asked him a few questions. He said, I'm from so and so. I thought, you are. Strange, isn't it? How things well, the government, grow. the government, obviously, you know, the government is naive in my view to think that the government have never looked at crop circles or don't 
continue to monitor it. And there's a couple of good reasons for that. First of all, Salisbury, um, the area of Wiltshire, is a very, very large military area. So so the security and, and what goes on in that area, in the airspace around that area and in, and in the land around that area because of all the military installations, um, is, is quite strong. You know, they, they'd need to know. Um, the, so when, the, the, if, if you read Freddie Silver's book um, on crop circles, he'll talk to, he talks about when the government, it was raised in Parliament about the crop circles, and um, a scientist was commissioned by yeah. the government to go out and examine them, and I met his son um, several years, in 2008 I first met his son. Um, that was when uh, I was... Um, doing tours you know in, the, in those years and and I asked his son what his father's report was back to the government and, and he said it was inconclusive he went back and said this is coming from an unknown origin and 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 so a lot of us believe that the Doug and Dave campaign was an intelligence operation that that um that things were starting to get a little bit hot after the while they were simple circles, it was okay. There was no mention of man-made. But then when that big pictogram came in East Field, um, then the Doug and Dave story quickly followed the next year that kind of put it all to bed. And ever since then, there's always been this campaign of, oh, it's all done by people, nothing to see here, when you know a lot of us believe that there really is something to see here and that if people would l just listen to the, the actual details, they'd realise and so, so there were quite a lot of people who believed that there was a, a government operation to sort of put the put the stop on it, really, because they didn't want to get it out of hand. Um, and I and I believe that's true. Hmm. I do. Uh, there's a question from Joanne. What determines the location of a crop circles? Are they always near ley lines? They're not always near ley lines, but that area in Wiltshire, you know, Avebury and Stonehenge and uh, people like Hamish Miller and um, other dowsers and dowsing groups have, have, have well established that it's a hot spot for ley line areas, uh, for an area that contains all these ley lines. And and that, I've always thought that they are similar like similar to meridians, the Chinese meridians that the you know, acupuncture needles go in, mm. in your body, um, which is, you know, maybe why some of the stones are put in in certain areas to release or harness or redirect energy uh, in the land. I think there's probably a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, you know, um, truth to that, although it's not my field, so I can't say for sure. Uh, a man called Glenn um, Broughton did some research oh, back in 98, I think it was, uh, where one of the, the air things, features of Wiltshire is it's all chalk, um, the landscape is made of chalk, the ground, you know, the soil that's on top of it and the crops on yeah. top of that, but underneath it's chalk. And un and there are all these little underwater aquifers. So water runs through all these little caves and channels, you know, through the chalk. And he plotted where the crop circles appeared and found that sort of 98% of them appear above these underwater aquifers. So there's a deep connection to water and what Glenn considered to be earth energies. Uh, and he's a specialist on that. He runs a company called um, um, Journeys with Soul. He takes people around sacred sites and you know encourages them to feel energy and experience it. Oh, yeah. So he's the guy that did all that research. Um, I also believe because my my interest is part of my interest is communication and and communication. I studied language and communication at university, and um, a big thing about any communication is context. And so the context of the crop circles is where they are. Uh, and so you know, that area was the first area that that we, as, a, as an island, that we felled the trees and began to farm. We stopped being hunter-gatherers and we became farmers in that location. So there's right. a very, there's a very um, subtle kind of hint to this is where we transformed as a species how we get energy, right? Um, you know the, the the farming that was that, that that developed into what basically built the British Empire. You know, it was that we used to have corn exchanges and the wealth of individuals once they began to grow a surplus of That's grain. Right, yeah, 
yeah, surplus of grain led to wealth, right? It led to people having more wealth and land than others. And it led to, you know, massive amounts of wealth and it led to the economy that we have today from us growing crops. So there's a whole history of our species and where we've been and where we've come from to where we are now that relates to that area very directly. So, uh, so I think it's not just about where these um, energy ley lines are and stuff like that. I think that is a factor, but I think that there are also another of, a number of other factors, such as the farming area and Stonehenge and Avebury and what our ancestors were doing around there that's also pointing to some part of the yeah. communication. Yeah. Thank you for that. I think okay. Rebecca's got another question. Harry, what would be the best way to find out when or where a new one had been created okay so if we go on a facebook group uh or website called i think the website's different to the facebook group uh the facebook the website's called crop circle connector.com they publish um uh, new crop circles when they're discovered people normally report them to them i think their facebook group is called crop circles uh, let me find it for you uh Crop circles, UFOs, and ancient mystery, mysteries and scientific speculations. It's a bit of a mouthful. Um, that's a Facebook group. And they're connected to Crop Circle Connector. So they'll publish on Facebook as well as... Right. So, uh, yeah. They, they've got an excellent photographer who sort of does all their photography for them. A man called Nick Ball. Um, he runs a company called Stonehenge Dronescapes. So you can find his Facebook page as well. well sounds um, interesting. That's, that's That's where you'll find out. Right, thank you for that. Uh, have you ever tried creating a crop circle yourself then? No. Never been interested to. So people have asked me to, but I always imagined, wouldn't it be great, you know, because, uh, for someone to take a photo of me stamping down crop and then they'd publish it everywhere and say, look, it's Gary it's King, Gary. he makes all the crop circles. I'd never live it down. So no, I stayed away from that Yes. <laughs> have you ever seen a, a UFO then? Back in the day, uh, 98, I saw a UFO. I've only ever seen a couple. Um, I was with my son and a friend. We, there was three of us. We saw over a couple of days, we were at a music festival in Shepton Mallet, and we saw unexplained lights that moved very fast. Yeah, uh, but that's all they were, really, lights in the sky that moved incredibly fast. What would you say to somebody who wants to learn more about crop sir? circles uh, is the what's the best books out there to read to get to know a little bit more about crop circles and how they so, work there's a bunch of them um so it depends what their interests are if they want to find out you know what the research is about you know scientific research for example like um, what what analysis has been done on the soil and stuff like that um, there's there's a book uh, by Freddie Sil Silver, his name is, um, S-I-L-V-A. I can't remember the title of the book, but if you Google Crop Circles and Freddie Silver, you'll find his book. Andy Thomas, a man called Andy Thomas, has written two or three books on crop circles. My dear friend, Mike, who's now passed, Michael Glickman, wrote a book called The Bones of God. Um... Uh, you can go on websites like Crop Circle Connector that I mentioned earlier, uh, although they sort of, they they open to any view. They sort of, you know, they sort of don't discriminate or discern between anything. They'll just be an open forum for what anybody wants to say, whereas you might find other people will be more specialist in the areas that they're interested in. So um, Steve and Karen Alexander run a website called temporarytemples.co.uk. That's... Steve takes photographs and Karen, uh, his partner, writes very intelligently about crop circles. 30 years experience each. They've been around right. a long time, so they're good people to listen to. Lucy Pringle, she has a website, lucypringle.com. She's done a lot of research with Parkinson's sufferers, scientific studies where she's taken people in crop circles and they've said that they felt their symptoms have been alleviated by going in them. She's done scientific stuff with doctors with that, so you can find Ooh. out about that. Yes. Um, yeah, that, that's and then just you know generally, you can't replace that's, that's, that's interesting. 
yeah, there's lots of interesting stuff that's out there. There really is lots of interesting stuff. Bert Janssen, he's a Dutch researcher who now lives in America. He's written a book called The Organizing Principle. Um, he's coming on my podcast at the end of this month, um, which I'm launching next month. It's called Against the Grain. Um, I've already got a couple of interviews in the bag. I'm recording five or six before I launch the, the show, but I'm looking to start on the 1st of May. I've already got some good guests coming on, so tune in for that one if you can um but Bert Janssen you know we've been friends for for years he's been around since the early 90s he's a mathematician who's done some fantastic geometric analysis and solved some of the hidden messages that we found in crop oh, circles God, yeah but yeah um so yeah there's there's a bunch of stuff out there and then of course there's nothing which which can replace your own first-hand experience which means you know you've got to get in the car and drive to Wiltshire and walk experience in yeah exactly Exactly. You know, um, some some people say what, but when they're making a crop circle, um, things happen to them. Mm. Paranormal things happen to them. They do, yeah. But those very same people also spend a lot of time attacking people like myself uh, who say that they've experienced a crop circle mysteriously appearing in front of them, like I did in 2007. You know, we have three of us sitting on top of a hill and... There wasn't a crop circle there at 11 o'clock. We had cameras looking at the field all night. And at 20 past three in the morning, there was a thousand foot crop circle in the field in the dark in front of us. Now, they spent those very same people who say that they have paranormal experiences when they make them, then attack me and they've attacked all the other people. They've been Matthew Williams, people that you mentioned earlier. So so I always get a little bit confused as to why why they can have paranormal experiences when they're making them with boards, but they attack everybody else that has paranormal experiences of their own within crop circles that doesn't involve them. You'd think that they would say, oh, God, yeah, we have weird stuff happen to us around those things as well when we're making them um, and, and sympathise with those people, but they don't. They attack them. So... So I'm always a little bit confused by their motives, really, to be honest. Yeah, I can imagine so as well. Uh, another question here from Lucia. Question from Gary. Gary, uh, so do you think the crop circles was made by ancient aliens or multi-dimensional be beings? I don't know. I don't know who the authors of the crop circles are, and it's obvious to me that uh, whatever it is wants to remain mysterious. Um, I, I I often give this analogy when I'm at a conference, and you know, I, um, people ask this question fairly regularly, and it's a good question. But but you know, um, we have to. I think, I, like myself, I had to sort of move my head around and think about it a different way. Imagine. Yeah. Imagine that you woke up this morning, right? And you went when you came downstairs, a, a card, a postcard had been put through your letterbox, and on that postcard was a really strange symbol, and it was and it was and it was drawn in a way that with a technique that you'd never really seen before. Okay, and and then you walk outside, and and all your neighbours in the street are all always also outside at exactly the same time, holding a postcard up with a symbol on it, right? And they're saying what's this and you're going what's that you know and you all question it what where did that come from i wonder who put this through our door okay so then you spend you know a couple of nights and then there's another one and then you know a few nights later there's three that come through your door and then seven the next day right and after 10 years it's been going on and you've had several thousand of them no one's ever caught the people coming in the street and putting them through the letterbox right you've set traps you've done watches you put people at the end of the street you put cameras up but you never catch them right and yet the symbols keep coming through your letterbox right well then so after 20 years same thing still never caught them 30 40 there's been some close calls where you, someone's seen something strange and they might have a little fuzzy light on a camera or something right and you go oh that maybe that's it you know but, yeah but you never catch it right so then you have to say to yourself well at what point do i say it's obvious to me that this postman wishes to remain anonymous and maybe because all the symbols that he's put through my door are different maybe he wants me to focus on what do they mean hmm very so so I, I don't know i don't know i don't know who i think it's actually healthy not to know i think it's healthy 
to Agra. embrace embrace the mystery. Yeah, uh, another question from Steph. What is Gary's take on a video from the late nineties of crop circles being formed in real time? Uh, I think I think that was a, a genuine um, thing, um, and I and I think that because uh, if you watch a documentary that I was involved in a few years ago called Crop Circle Realities, I give a very detailed explanation of why I think it. But in a nutshell. Um, the analysis of the video and the technology of the time in 1996 and the, the the alternative to it being something mysterious would have had to mean that the person who created the video would have had to have driven to Bristol. This is this counter story, right? That he drove to Bristol, he animated yeah. the footage and that he faked it and then drove back and was back in Wiltshire in the er early in the morning, about half past 10. Um, and that the crop circle that wasn't there the night before was now there in the morning. So he engineered the crop circle being made, the video being faked um, all in one night and then came back and showed it to everybody. And, and then when you analyze the video, because the video moved up and down because it was handheld, all those little balls of light move evenly across the field. And at 25 frames a second, that meant that every single um, ball of light would have had to been painted onto each frame, okay, which takes time. So in 2004, they asked some Disney animators because animation technology has only really gone incredibly easy for people to do on their laptops in the last 15 years or so. Back in the 90s, yeah. Even Di even Disney animators, when they looked and analysed that footage, which showed no artefacts, no evidence of being faked, uh, frame by frame, when when we had it done by labs, um, they said, uh, we, you know, we said, how much would you charge us and how long would it take for you to make that for us? And this was um, eight years later, from 96 to 2004. And they said, oh, a couple of weeks, but any any decent animator would be able to spot it under analysis. He said we couldn't fake it like that so so that's the reason that i think that um that there's something in it yeah um you, you went to live in for, for quite a while did you see any crop circles out there then N not at the time i was there no there have been crop circles in mexico um, which were, and I worked for a news company in, in uh, Mexico City. So uh, they, they'd been down and investigated them. Um, so, you know, they were part of the show that we used to put on. On a Sunday, we used to have a two hour special that covered UFOs and crop circles. And we did mainstream news during the night or weeknights. Um, so there have been crop circles, far less than there have been in England. But, um, yep, yeah, they've had them. Yeah, it, are they still caring now then around Wiltshire and, and, and districts like that? They are. There's less There's less of them. The numbers are lower these, these uh, last six or seven years maybe. They've been less. Uh, the quality is still very good um, in the ones that do occur. Some really beautiful ones and some really, really... <laughs> Like, for example, last year, the theme of last year, and I wrote about this, people can read read my essays on um, my website, against the grain dot site. Um, so we get, we get these crop circles where there's big circles where all standing wheat is in the centre and there's no central point. So, so you might have a, a circle of wheat, the standing wheat, the oh. sort of 200 feet in diameter, but you cannot walk into crop and not flatten it. It's too, the plants are too close together so if you walk into it once you've walked into it that's it that crop's flattened and it's not it's not you can't pull it back up again so if you see a circle try and draw a circle right. without put, without putting a compass point on the paper paper try and draw a perfect circle you it's it's almost impossible yeah it can be done but it's almost impossible it's impossible uh, yeah now, then try and do one that's 200 feet in diameter in a field of wheat without touching the center and then try and do oh one in then try and do one in a field of wheat over 200 feet in diameter when it's on uneven ground 
because then you have to draw an egg shaped um, uh, diagram on the on the ground so that it looks circular from above because you've got to compensate for the unevenness of the ground ah right try and do that without a center draw an egg that's perfectly formed so that it makes you think it look this like... oh. go ahead these some of these uh are giving giving us some messages about about the future Mm, no. Um, uh, Karen Alexander, who I mentioned earlier, she used to be a psychotherapist, and she said, "When you're a therapist, right? You what you do when you sit down with your with your patient is that you want to know where they've been and where they are now, right? So that they can make informed decisions about yeah. which way to go in the future." So, so in order to get the right direction for the course of your life, if you've, if you've, if you don't know where you've come from, where you are now, then you're going to have trouble guiding your life in the future, right? Into the future. And so, she calls yeah. that putting your putting your cards on the table. Yeah, someone needs to be honest with their therapist and say, you know, this is what happened to me when I was younger, and this made me think like this, and this made me, and I'm not sure what you know what this did to me, but this happened, and. And, and this is where I am now. And then the therapist will listen and, and probably see things that you can't see and be able to say, right, okay, this has made this happen. This has made this happen. This led you there. And then and if you don't, if you, if you can see that more clearly, you can see that if you carry on on that path, you're going to end up down there and that's the future. Or you can say, okay, I don't want to, I don't want to end up down there. I, I, now I know where I am yeah. and why I, I'm going to go a different direction. Right. Well, I think the crop circles are like cards on the table for humanity. Why did they're, this? They're showing us where we've been, right? And that was where we grew farm, where we began to farm, how we got wealthy, and how we're about to kill each other over greed, power, money, land ownership, right? Also, we've got in the news at the moment, um, they're trying to stop farming, <laughs> They don't want to stop producing food in the name of climate change and stuff like this, right? Without having a proper debate about what it would be like for all yeah. of us without any without any food. So so it's become what's, that, what's all that about? Well, that's a whole other story. But but if the crop circles were talking about something in the future, then back in nineteen seventy nine, maybe they knew that we'd end up here now where we're going to start stopping farming and they were drawing our attention to that. Who knows? But but I like to think of the grounded way of um, of that they're 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 helping us to see where our future lies and and make and leaving it to us to make decisions about which direction we're going to go in rather than telling us where to go. Yeah. What well, um, what have you what have you got planned for the future yourself then? So my podcast. What are you looking working... else into? Uh, so my podcast is uh, being launched hopefully on the 1st of May. That's been a project that I've had ongoing for the last four months now to get it all up and done, up and running, you know, the the logistics of it all, as you know, Bob. Um, yeah. I'm really excited about that. Uh, I've built my website now against the grain. I just spent the last two years doing um, engineering exams, would you believe? When I came back from Mexico, I, I stopped working in journalism when I came back from Mexico, and I'm, I've been spent the last two years training to be an engineer. Uh, for for vehicles that have been in road traffic accidents, you know, for insurance companies to assess what's oh, happening. Right. It's been really interesting. So I'm earning my living, um, you know, working in that area. And uh, that's why I haven't been to the crop circle so much over the last couple of years. So I've been engaged in that. But at the same time, building this podcast um, against the grain, my Facebook page and my uh, web website and um, YouTube channel, uh, so I'm looking to make more content uh, and do some really great podcasts and see where it takes me. Yeah, because there's always guys out there who probably want to be on your show. That's who you are as well, because you've travelled the world. You've been to some fantastic places. And lots yeah. of... Yeah, I, I, you're right, Bob. I, I mean, I had the very, very great privilege last night to. So, so in 2008, I um, I did a crop circle. So it was one of my early tours, actually, for for a, a yoga teacher from America. And 
Her name's Carly G. She runs an organization called Tri Yoga. Uh, I hadn't heard of them before then. And then a couple of days later, she brought her guru um, over from, he was, he's an Indian man, but he was in London. She brought him to Wiltshire and hired me to take him around the crop circles. And I had several profound experiences with these with this man and these people um, and as and as a result of that went and spent three months living in his ashram in india right uh, back in 2008 and i've been connected with them ever since really? you know um, yeah well last night i interviewed carly g on my podcast that's one of the shows that will be coming up so this international yoga teacher who's got like 17 ah. schools in china she's got schools in korea japan all over america all over europe she's helped thousands of people in the last 40 years um learn a system of yoga called yoga flow try yoga um uh and she's brought yoga to the masses uh, in so many ways a real spiritual ambassador well she came on my show last night so she's she's one of the you know the people that um i'm really excited to be able to to uh let people you know hear their story hear their conversation but it's, it it sounds like these crop circles you could you could do healings inside them then um some people have done it and some people have had spontaneous healings that they've claimed you know uh by going in crop circles it's it's certainly something that you know um healers could try it's not my field of course but there that's the wonderful thing about crop circles there are so many different avenues to come at it from and it, and it really does depend on what your thing is i totally agree with that as well we're about about run out of time unfortunately tell everybody where they can find you again uh, about your new podcast and when it's going to come out. And uh, if anybody wants to get in touch with you. Sure. Um, so I run a, f a Facebook group called Against the Grain. My website has the same name, againstthegrain.site. Uh, my YouTube channel uh, is Against the Grain. And my podcast, of course, Against the Grain, is coming out uh, on the 1st of May. I'm launching. I've got... Um, the three or four more guests lined up over April so that I've got six guests in the bag when I launch. Um, Bert Janssen's coming on, Andy Thomas is coming on, Scott Onstott is coming on, Chrissy Newton. Uh, Chrissy Newton was the journalist. She runs a website called, a podcast called The Debrief. In, um, she's out of Toronto in Canada. She interviewed uh, Leslie Keane oh, and Ralph right. Blumenthal, the journalists that, that released the story about David Grush, who says that the government have got alien technology so i'm going to be interviewing her on the 19th yeah. of april so uh, carlegy who i just mentioned i interviewed richard vobes the youtuber he's he's uh he's come on the show as well so i've got some really great guests and a little a, a list of other people that that are in, you know, coming in the future so please stay tuned Brilliant. for my podcast yeah and what night is it going to be on uh, probably a Wednesday. Uh, I think it's a Wednesday. May the 1st is when I'm hoping to launch. Uh, I'm pretty sure when I looked recently, it was a Wednesday. Uh, one, two, three, it's a Wednesday. So Wednesday evenings, I'm going to aim for like eight or nine o'clock, something like that. Fingers crossed it all comes together by then. I'm sure it will do. It will do. Well, everybody said, what a fantastic guest we've had, we've had on tonight. Well, thanks you know, very Rebecca, much. Great questions. Steph. Oh, yes. Stars in there. Diane's been in there. There's been quite a bit Steph as well. She's had some really good questions for you tonight as well. Yeah, so Absolutely. thank you again. Uh, my next Wednesday is Kathleen Marsden next Wednesday. Uh, really Hi. interesting woman. Uh, I've had her on the show previously. Um, we'll have a great time again with her again. Um, so thank you again, Gary. Have a lovely weekend. You too, Bob. And to all the guests, all the, everybody in the chat room. That always makes the show when people are in the chat room and loads of questions. Thank you. And good night. Good night. And you take care. You too, Bob. Take Thank care, you. Mate. Bye. 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 Finish the show.